between the Americans and the British sections on the eastern side of the Vera estuary was Omaha Beach. The men of the Big Red One and the 29th Infantry Divisions growling through the choppy seas in their small landing craft, wet, cold and seasick. Everywhere you look, as far as you could see, floating in the water with bodies. That's the first time I had ever seen anything like that. We knew that that was war and that, and that was it. I mean, that, that, that's what you were going to do there. The troops embarked on the landing ships in the small port of Weymouth, in the sleepy county of Dorset, England. Some were fresh straight from the USA. Others had been in England for a couple of years and they were stationed around the small village of Broadmain, becoming part of the local community. And that's where we uh, started, you know, maneuvering and, and practicing. Some even carved their names in the trees around the camp as it grew in size with men and machines until the area resembled a green canvas and camouflaged vehicle park. In the first week of June, 1944, camps like D5 in Broadmain were sealed off. The villagers wondered what had happened to their boisterous neighbors. Then came the roar of engines and tanks and trucks. And almost overnight, the camps emptied. Convoys of vehicles snaking through the crowded lanes, taking men and machines to the hard standings in and around Weymouth. The armour was embarking to become part of the greatest seaborne invasion the world had ever seen. Many of those young men would not see the end of that day. This June 2022, low loaders carrying large green vehicles once again began arriving on the D5 sites in Broadmain. Throughout the day and night, the event organizers and volunteers began marshalling the largest number of armoured vehicles seen in the area since World War II. When your hobby is restoring and maintaining old vehicles from this era, you try and keep them as original as possible. And it's immensely satisfying to match your vehicle to a location where it and others like it were in use over 75 years ago. It's also an incredible opportunity to bring these heavyweight relics of a hugely important time in world history together again and run them as they once were intended. It's an expensive and time-consuming pastime, requiring dedication and considerable skill to keep these machines in good, roadworthy condition. Details such as weapons, uniforms and other attachments are often carefully researched and matched to the vehicle. Reenactment trips to Normandy and Belgium, 10 days living in field. Bringing an authenticity to proceedings. And all of that comes at a price. There are less than a dozen Shermans in running order in the UK and Jim Clark's high-speed tractor and gun is perhaps the only running example in private hands in the world. They are all here to recreate the convoy runs from June 1944. This is Armour and Embarkation 2022. It took almost a day for the camp to set up, get the vehicles and guns unloaded, renew acquaintances, get the tanks warmed up, and then the job of having everybody in line ready for the weekend's convoy driving, all under the watchful eyes of the organizers. As the camp began to fill up, we were all beginning to realize the extent of the operation. First, there was one Sherman, then two, 
then three, then four. And then more tanks, more half-tracks, heavy wreckers, prime movers and trucks, all assembling for the next day's event. Friday night saw a quick trip for some of the group to Weymouth for fish and chips, very close to the original wartime embarkation docks. Later as the first day drew to a close and we returned to the camp, the numbers of vehicles had increased again. We retired to our beds ready for the early morning driver's briefing and our first full day with a complete convoy of 90 or more big green machines. This was going to be one hell of a weekend. Early morning, 7 a.m. All the tanks and guns and trucks, half tracks are getting assembled. Whenever you have an operation like this, the amount of material that's involved is incredible. Around the camp, the men are slowly getting themselves organized. A restless night, some of them managed to sleep, some didn't. The briefing delivered by international man of mystery, Jack Beckett, was concise and simple as most of the work had been done before by the full organising team. Emphasis was placed on safety and environmental issues and with a tangible air of excitement, the vehicles and drivers began their start-up routines and manoeuvred into position for the convoy run. The indispensable and unflappable dispatch riders, under the guidance of Peter Brown, like sheepdogs with an unruly herd, went over route planning and responsibilities. Their main jobs were to keep the convoy together and rolling, block off side roads for a while, and establish safe crossing points for the convoy. But experience and dedication were on their side. Yeah. Convoy formed up in time and in position. Jack blew his whistle to signal the commencement of a truly historic event. Wailing sirens and growling engines, the convoy roared through the narrow streets and lanes of Broadmain. The waving crowds cheering them on as the vehicles followed the exact route as the American troops did just before D-Day in 44. Part 
driver and second camera was ensconced in Jim Clark's very rare high-speed tractor, towing his 90mm anti-aircraft gun, and sometimes driven by Jim's fiancée, Abby. I had to hot swap and jump from vehicle to vehicle as the convoy progressed. It was the first time I'd shared a vehicle with a policeman in a long, long time, and that's all behind me now. Many thanks to old mate Jason with his diamond C, who slowed down, but didn't stop, to pick me up as the rain came down. Many of the larger vehicles braved the river crossing at Martin's Fall. This was no indulgent diversion for the drivers. Part of the training for D-Day and beyond was wading from the landing ships to the beaches and crossing rivers further inland in Normandy. And the ford here was used for this purpose. When one of the small British infantry carriers got a little swamped, help was on hand with an American Wardle France record, doing what it was built to do and driven by Bill Hembry.
convoy whined and wheeled its way through the forest track and came to a halt to form up before a major road crossing. Time for some running adjustments and a quick cover. It was also another chance to take stock of what we had done with these 80 year old vehicles. And this was just the first morning. The ever busy organisers and dispatch riders signalled that the road crossing ahead was being prepared. The huge engines once again roared into life and we began to get ready for another important and historic leg of our journey. With firm but sympathetic diplomacy, the dispatch rider team halted the main road traffic and signalled the convoy to advance. This is heavy metal in action, and we are just going to let this lot roll.
All 70 plus vehicles rolled into the Tank Museum at Bovington for a display, spot of lunch and tour of this impressive institution. The curator David Willey was on hand to oversee proceedings. Soon Jack's whistle blew again and we set off to put some of the tanks and half-tracks through their paces on the British Army's tank testing ground. Tracks threw up incredible clouds of dust as they roared between the trees. and it gave us a chance to look at the size of the column. The word impressive does not do this site justice. Each one of these vehicles has a pedigree of its own. Their individual history playing a part in the greatest conflict the world has ever seen. Suitably covered in dust and grime, we rolled off again, this time in Dick Shepherd's half-track, for the market town of Dorchester. Once more the crowds were out in force, waving and cheering us on as we rumbled through the streets and formed up as part of a historic display, echoing scenes in this town from almost 80 years ago. Sufficiently refreshed and replenished, the drive back to camp was without incident. Despite the best attempts of an unnamed driver with his high speed tractor and gun, who missed a turn and cut a short but distinct path of his own. Back in Broad Main, Steve Ellis George and his D Day festival team had got the village hall and green ready for the evening's entertainment music, food and drink. It was a tired and grimy collection of drivers and passengers who made their way back to their campsites later in the evening. Despite the party atmosphere, a good night's sleep was necessary because in the morning we were to do it all again. Some would be going to Weymouth and others across country to Martinstown for a hog roast lunch. 